for my kids at school.
service. I have several announcements this morning, but I will be quick. Um, just a reminder, the deadline to order your poinsettias is today in order for us to procure them from the Arkansas Delta Choir to help with fundraising for the trip um, for Alex and the choir to sing at Carnegie Hall. So if you've not had a chance to do that, um, you can still place those orders today. The order forms can be found um, in the ante room beside the Boltons. We're still in need of volunteers to pack and or deliver backpacks. Uh, the building is open between 9 and 2, Monday through Thursday, for anyone that needs access, and the backpacks need to be delivered on Thursdays. We ask um, if you would please start collecting now for our annual cornucopia um, that will be placed in our sanctuary in November. Um, we will ask that you leave the long-lasting produce under the stairs in the education building and uh, the deadline for that is next week, November 6th. Uh, Keith Cranford has been hospitalized but is now home. Um, as he was hospitalized, Claire also fell ill but is feeling much better. Um, they are both at home and resting and doing well, so continue prayers for them. Session will meet next Sunday, the 6th, um, following worship, November 6th, uh, and then Thanksgiving potluck will be the following Sunday, November 13th, following worship. Um, Advent is right around the corner, so for anyone interested in purchasing an Advent book, you can contact Ruth Ann in the church office um, starting Wednesday, when she's back in the church office on Wednesday. And as always, if you have not had a chance to join us on our, in our Monday morning one-word discussion, coffee hour, um, please do. We'd love to have you. Today we had a discussion, wonderful discussion, led by Kim around the word mercy. And next week we will be discussing the word rest. Are there any other announcements? Okay. Thank you.
They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. In the company of all God's saints and pilgrims, come and worship. We come with prayer and praise to find our strength renewed. Please join me as we stand together and sing hymn number 326. Join me as we pray our prayer of confession. Gracious God, you have been faithful to us in every generation, yet we confess that we are not so faithful to you. We shrink from costly discipleship, and we seek cheap grace. Forgive our fleeting enthusiasms 
and our shallow commitments, and guide us always with the love and mercy we witness in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please take a moment of silent reflection. Dear friends, while it is true that we have all sinned, it is a greater truth that we are forgiven through God's love in Jesus Christ. Be at peace with God, with yourself, and with one another. And also with you. Amen. May we stand for the glory of God. Samaria, just as I did Damascus. 
My powerful hand grabbed hold of the kingdoms whose people worship statues of God. They have more gods than Jerusalem, and Samaria did. I took over Samaria and its statues of God. In the same way, I will take Jerusalem and its gods. The Lord, the Lord will finish everything he has planned to do against Mount Zion and Jerusalem. Then he will say, Now I punish the king of Assyria. I will punish him because his hearts and his eyes were so proud, the king of Assyria says. But my power, I have taken over all these nations. I am very wise. I have great understanding. I have wiped out the borders between nations. I have taken their treasures. Like a great hero, I have hero, brought their kings under my control. I have taken the wealth of the nations. It was as easy as reaching into a bird's nest. I've gathered the riches of all of these countries. It was as easy as gathering eggs that have been left in a nest. Not a single baby bird flapped its wings. Not one of them opened, it, opened its mouth to chirp. Does an axe claim to be more important than the person who swings it? Does a saw brag that it is better than the one who uses it? That would be like a stick swinging the person who picks it up. It would be like a war club waving the one who carries it. So the Lord who rules over all will send a sickness. The Lord will send it on the king of Assyria's strong fighting men. It will make them weaker and weaker. The army he was so proud of will be completely destroyed. It will be as if it had been burned in a fire. The Lord is the light of Israel. He will become a fire. Israel's holy one will become a flame. In a single day he will burn up all Assyria's bushes. He will destroy all of their forms. He will completely destroy the beauty of the forests and the rich farmlands. The Assyrian army will be like a sick person who becomes weaker and weaker. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
purpose under heaven. Thank you so much. Delightful this morning, Christy. Thank you. Uh, what a blessing. What a blessing it is to be here with you all. Uh, I am, uh, it is a time now uh, for us to turn to our gospel reading for today. Take a look at um, what Luke's gospel tells us about an encounter Jesus had with a wee little man. You know who I'm talking about, right? Everybody knows the wee little man. Uh, not a leprechaun, but Zacchaeus. And uh, it's in Luke chapter 10, uh, excuse me, 19 verses 1 through 10. Let us listen together to God's word as we hear the scripture read. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, because, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your home today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here I now give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today, today, salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Friends, this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Pray with me. Lord, in these moments, it is uh, our simple and sincere desire that, that through the illumination of your spirit, your word would um, find a place in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives and bear fruit as did that simple word that Jesus spoke to our brother Zacchaeus so many years ago. For we pray it in the name of Christ. Amen. So let's get going with a groaner this morning. How about that? A real groaner. Do you know who the shortest man in the Bible was? Well, it was not Nehemiah. I said it was a groaner. I gave you fair warning. It was not Bildad the Shuhite. I did mention it was a groaner. Perhaps it could have been Peter. Because the Bible says Peter slept on his watch. That's pretty short. You can sleep on your watch. Well, that's all the groaners I have for you. That's all the jokes I can think of. The shortest man in the Bible. But... There's only one really mentioned uh, that, uh, of short stature, that's Zacchaeus. And if you ever recall being in Sunday school as a child or maybe vacation Bible school, some other place, you probably can remember singing that little ditty about the wee little man who uh, looked to see Jesus and climbed up in a tree so that he could better see. So Zacchaeus wins the prize, perhaps, for the person of shortest stature. You know, if, if you look it up just a little bit, it doesn't take much these days to Google anything, but the average height of a man, a Middle Eastern man, in the days of Jesus was about five foot five. And Zacchaeus was notably shorter than that. So I'm thinking Mickey Rooney or, um, you know, at least Danny DeVito, something like that. Short. Short Zacchaeus. And because the Bible uh, does mention that he is short, 
it seems like a big part of what the passage is trying to get us to see is how difficult it was for Zacchaeus to see Jesus. And his short stature had something to do with that, but I'm going to suggest there may be more to this story. Why can't they see? Why can't Zacchaeus see Jesus? Hey, I like the story because it begins by making it pretty clear that Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. He was driven to see Jesus. He was compelled to get close enough so that he could see Jesus now. Jesus, as he goes about doing good and healing and teaching, Jesus impacts a lot of lives. And, and we've been following through Luke's gospel and we see a lot of encounters with Jesus. And everywhere he goes and everybody he encounters, Jesus sets hope alive. And frees up people to live out their full potential and serve. Zacchaeus no doubt heard of Jesus. He was Jewish by ethnicity, by the way. He was a Jewish man living in this community of Jericho. We know a little bit about the history of Jericho. Jericho was a rather cosmopolitan kind of city, an advanced. Zacchaeus probably lived in whatever their equivalent was of a gated community in this affluent neighborhood. It was a center of commerce and a hubbub uh, bounced about. So it was a big deal. No wonder we find Zacchaeus in this town. Because Zacchaeus, we're told a couple of things. He was a tax collector and he was Loaded. He had money. There's good reason for that, that Zacchaeus is here in Jericho among the well-to-do, and Zacchaeus is a pretty well-to-do person himself, a tax collector. You see, in the days of Jesus, the Roman, well, a tax auditor even today is not really somebody you want to go to lunch with if you can help it, right? And I'm guessing if you happen to be a tax auditor right now, God bless you, and um, I mean, no disrespect. In fact, I'd love to go to lunch with you, especially if you're on my toes. <laughs> Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And in the days of Jesus, a tax collector, that was a job. The Romans were a pretty oppressive administration, and they ruled the Jewish people with pretty iron fists. And to collect taxes in the Jewish neighborhoods, they didn't send a Roman tax collector, in part because he would be every bit as welcome as a revenuer would be in the hills of Kentucky back in the day. Instead, they got one of their own. They put it out for bids. Whoever got the highest bid, a Jewish person who got the highest bid was the tax collector. And he would be allowed to collect all the taxes for the Roman government to Make sure that the flow of money kept coming in, but also he could keep anything over and above the amount they owed in taxes. So when Luke's gospel tells us that Zacchaeus was looking for a tree to climb, it's possible, just possible, and I'm not suggesting this is feasible, but it's possible Zacchaeus was climbing up in a tree because he didn't feel really safe down on the ground with all of his these religious zealots coming along with Jesus. Maybe he'd get up above the crowd. Jericho had a gushing spring in the middle of the center of town, and it was a place of liveliness. Of course, Zacchaeus was found here. This was his this was his place. This was where Zacchaeus felt at home. Except he didn't feel at home because Zacchaeus didn't have any friends. Zacchaeus didn't even have any Facebook friends. <laughs> he had some trolls. But nobody, nobody piled around with the tax collector. He was considered a traitor to his own people. But he wants to see Jesus. I'm going to put it out there for you. Perhaps we could say that Zacchaeus was driven by desperation. 
friendless, alone, successful, but empty life. I'm wondering if we shouldn't begin to think about some of the ways we experience desperation a little differently than we usually do. It carries a very negative connotation, doesn't it? A person that's desperate, that's, you know, that's not good. But you all know what I'm talking about. For some of you, some unsettling event has come along. Some upheaval in your life that rocks you back on your heels, jolts us out of our very settled life that we expected to unfold day after day just the same as yesterday. And suddenly, something comes along and rocks us. We experience desperation. For others, it's quiet desperation, a kind of continuum of misery. Maybe not altogether misery, but a life, we all know this, a life that is a feeling that there surely must be something more to the life than I have negotiated so far. Going to work every day and work that's not so fulfilling. A relationships that are draining. No real place to be at home, to be, to have Sabbath rest. Our word next week in our discussion is rest. A friend of mine, Michael Beck, is an author. Uh, he's going to teach with me and jointly an evangelism class at the seminary next spring. Uh, you might be able to audit that class. It's, it's available online. Some of you might want to think about that. Michael Beck has written many books, but this, his recent book is uh, called P uh, Painting with Ashes. It's a, it's a portrait of his own life. Painting with Ashes, when your weakness becomes your superpower, Dr. Beck writes in a very rough, raw, real, powerful way about his less than idyllic childhood of dysfunction and abuse. I encourage you to look that book up if you get a chance. It's available actually in digital format. It's called Painting with Ashes. When your weakness becomes your superpower, he's so, uh, so real. It's refreshing, really. He recalls one winter day. His mom, his mom's then husband, he doesn't call him stepdad, but his mom's then husband drove him on a snowmobile out into the deep woods of upper New York State. And with heavy snow falling all around him and night approaching, his mom's husband shoves him off the bike and drives off into the distance to leave him there. Desperation, he writes, is never a gift when you're experiencing it. But desperation is a gift when it becomes a teacher showing us who we really are and what we're capable of. It teaches us to more fully trust and rely upon God. Michael Beck, young Michael Beck, stood there with snow piling up around him motionless except for his shivering in the cold until some hours later he began to see a faint light in the darkness. It was his mother coming to rescue him. And I can see him now, this young Michael Beck out there waving his arms and shouting, I'm over here! Hey, I think that's what Zacchaeus was doing. I'm over here, Jesus. Can you see me? I'm trying to see you. I'm doing my best to see you. Perhaps this, this idea of desperation and God searching us out and seeing us is the real story behind our Genesis account of the first parents and their fall from God's grace. See, if they had been left in that paradise we call Eden, if they had been left there, they may 
never have known desperation as they come to know, being separated from God as they were. Or if they didn't know that desperation, they may never have known how wonderful it is to hear God's voice. Where are you? There's your gift. We are not alone in the universe. But God is looking for us and waiting for us to turn to receive the healing that God brings. Yeah. Zacchaeus had trouble seeing Jesus. But Jesus was looking for Zacchaeus. I, I want us to pay just a little bit of attention to what what role the crowds played in this story. I'm not going to keep you here all day, but the crowds in this story played a role that, um, sadly, I see frequently in the life of Jesus. The crowds of people that gathered around Jesus, the curiosity seekers, the onlookers, and, and even the core of disciples who were searching out the finer things of Jesus in spiritual matters, often became a barrier to people seeing Jesus. It's true. When the children, the little children, wanted to come and Jesus wanted to bring them into the inner circle, who stopped them? It was the disciples who said, no, 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 Jesus doesn't have time for you. You can't possibly be valuable enough for Jesus to waste his precious time on a bunch of kids. It was true the woman who ran along and scooted along and tried to keep her low profile as she reached from the crowd to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. It was, it was the disciples that said, you know, don't be bothering Jesus. He has important ministry to do. But Jesus stopped and said, someone's touched me. Healing's gone out from me. The crowds around Jesus became a barrier do you remember the story where Jesus was teaching and healing inside a house one day and four friends had to carry their paralytic, paralytic friend up on the roof and cut a hole in the roof? That's a little bit more than climbing a tree. That's going to extra to get to Jesus. Now listen. Hear me. For many in our world, in our current culture, for many in our world, the church is seen, perceived as a distant place, maybe even a place of harm, not a place for healing. And I just want to ask, why is that? Why is that? Well, it's... We're not the first. We're not the first. It goes all the way back. Jesus' disciples gathering around became a bit of an obstacle. Now, here are three, I believe, critical tendencies that create this barrier, and I'm going to share them quickly. The tendency, the first is a tendency to stop when our glass is half full. I, I'm sure you know the adage about glass half full and half empty. I toyed with making it fully full, but you'll get the picture, I hope. I was an honored guest at a special dinner party at a home, somebody's home, where the hostess was extraordinary, real Martha kind of servant. And after dinner, she insisted on clearing all the plates while we all sat around and talked, as may be the case for most of us. And she cleared the plates, and then she came back out to bring dessert. She's had a piece of pie down in front of me and then hurried off into the kitchen for some more. She was pretty perplexed when she came back a little while later. She said, oh, I thought I gave you yours. And she put another piece in front of my plate. <laughs> and it was only the third time when she went to the kitchen and came back out when it dawned on her. I was passing the dessert just as fast as I could. Sharing it with everybody at the table. 
I think guys, this is a good, this is a perfect example of how we do our walk with Christ, sharing the blessing. And if you haven't, if you're not able to share it around the table, if you are ready to stop when your glass is half full or when your dessert is sitting in front of you and enjoy that blessing without sharing it, you have missed the point of the blessing. It's how our faith should work. We're never done as long as we're the only ones being cared for. The church, church growth people used to have a coined a phrase called koinonitis. And uh, koinonia is a Greek word in the New Testament that talks about fellowship, the rich fellowship that the church has. Don't we have a good fellowship here? Pot, potluck dinner's here, something else. You know? It really is. We've got one coming up. Hope you get a chance to be there. Potluck dinner fellowship, koinonia. It's more than just being together. It's, it's a rich fellowship. Koinonitis occurs, according to the church of people, when that rich fellowship ends up causing us to be more inwardly focused and forget that we're not the only ones to serve. Just because you have your dessert in front of you, just because your needs are met, doesn't mean everybody's needs are being met. So I think one barrier is our tendency to stop when our needs are being met. Secondly, there's this universal need to feel good about ourselves. We all have it. We have it in lots of different ways. Some people have it more than others. But you can, you can see this in children growing up when they learn their tendencies to put each other down. We have lived in such a snarky society for so long. We've lived where the put-downs, the majoring put-downs of others, because if they're not as good as we are, we must be great, we must be better. In our story, the judgment comes from the Pharisees. The Pharisees were upset that Jesus would go and have a meal with a, with a sinner. But, you know, in the day of Jesus, when they made a list of sinners, there were two, there were two kinds of people that are going to make that list every time. The prostitutes and the tax collectors. They, they were on that list every time. And Jesus is going to spend time. Not, you know, it, it wasn't just let's hurry up and get a meal and then we can watch some Netflix pretty quickly. It, a meal in that day was an event. It was an all-day thing. Jesus sat in Zacchaeus' home and he, and he talked with him and he shared with him. And we know the result, don't we? A universal need to feel good about ourselves is expressed in the attitude of the Pharisees. No, 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 Jesus, you've got to understand. Right? We hear from God. It's God and then us and, and then you. Then we'll share with the, with the little people. Like Zacchaeus, he's pretty far down on the list. He might not even give an honorable mention. And Jesus said just quite simply, no, that's not, no, it's not how it works. In fact, he said, the sinners, the prostitutes, and the tax collectors, they all get into the kingdom before you do. Full mic drop. Hmm. Tax collectors and prostitutes are going in before you, Jesus said. Thirdly, there is a tendency. And I think this is part of the barrier, tendency, that we all have to put our finger on the scale a little bit to judge everybody else by one standard and judge ourselves by another one. I think we're all like this. We don't mean to. We probably even think we're being as fair as humanly possible. But our standards not always the same. We know our own thoughts, our intentions, and we tend to judge by our good intentions rather than our actions, but we judge other people by their actions. It is a pride, it is a pride that becomes a hindrance for people to see who Jesus really is. One of the greatest challenges of Jesus' message is this, even if we have entertained any evil thought in our mind, if we have entertained if we have entertained for a moment any temptation and considered applying it to our life, we've already sinned 
and Zacchaeus and you and me are on the same level playing field. Equally in need of God's grace. Oh, how could Zacchaeus ever think he'd be righteous enough to get close to Jesus? As righteous as Jesus is, as unrighteous as Zacchaeus was. But he did. And we have some evidence in this scripture of a changed life. Zacchaeus, at the end of his story, stands up and says, Jesus, if I've taken, I'm going to give half my stuff away. The thing that was so valuable to him a few hours before, his, his well-being, suddenly not as important to him. Jesus had decided to be his friend. And, and, and Jesus brought hope into his situation. Take note of the order that Jesus never said. First you get your life right, Zacchaeus, and then I'll be your friend. Get it together, Zacchaeus. Then I can come and sit at your table, put my feet under your table, be your friend. I can listen to you and you can hear me. No, at the end of this passage, Jesus says today, 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 salvation's come to this household. You're also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. People are a valuable treasure to God. Every person is a valuable treasure and precious to God, worthy of reclaiming. And friends, the best news I have to bring to you today is that we're all invited to the treasure hunt. You like, you like hunting treasure? I do. I saw somebody the other day picking up rocks out in the middle of a park somewhere, and I know it's, they're geocaching. I don't really know what that is, but they were looking for something. Clearly. It's fun to, to hunt the treasure. Every person is worthy of reclaiming. God has invited us to be part of the treasure hunt. And for all the innate reasons that we might be the weakest link, it is also true that we are the missing link. We are the way God connects with people, at least with some people. Robert Kennedy spoke in 1969 to a group of South African students who were struggling with apartheid and, and human rights. He too saw that it was possible for them to drop the baton, to not be able to carry forward, to carry out their intent, to lose momentum. And so he pointed out some of the obstacles they would face. This is a very secularized understanding, but if it's true for the secular world, is it not possible it's much more true in the spiritual world? Just, just listen. Robert Kennedy said, first is the danger of futility, the belief that there's nothing one man or one woman can do against the enormous array of the world's ills, against misery, against ignorance, against injustice, against violence. And yet many of the world's great movements of thought and action have flowed from the work of a single person. And he gives a few examples. You would know them all. Few will have the greatness to bend history, he writes. But each of us can work to change a small portion of the events. And in the total of all these acts will be written the history of this generation. It is from numberless, diverse acts of courage, such as these, that the belief that human history is thus shaped. Each time a man or woman stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope in crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. If it's true in a secular way, imagine how much more in the realm of God's mission to reclaim lost humanity, how each one of us can set into motion a ripple of hope that changes lives. As Zacchaeus was changed, and one at a time changed the course of human history. Your repentance doesn't lead 
Your repentance doesn't lead to transformation. It's not something you do. It's the relationship with Jesus, and that's the agent of transforming your life and others. So here it is. A lot of folks, a lot of folks, will see Jesus because you do. Pray with me. Asking God to bless the reading of your word to our understanding, bless our lives that we embody as, as, as fully as we're capable of doing. We know it will be faulty and failing, but it's as fully as we're capable of doing to embody that desire that Jesus expressed, I came to seek and to save the lost. Thank you for that reassurance in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Folks, it's appropriate that we have listened for and heard the word of God, that we respond by reciting our creed, a faith uh, that we have inherited from our fathers, the Apostles' Creed, found on page 35 in the front of your hymnal. If you don't know it by heart, you turn there, please. And let us say together as we confess the faith of our baptism. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May be seated. We have, uh, we want to uh, remember to pray for, it is a, a Halloween season, so we want to remember to pray for our trick-or-treaters and uh, those that uh, will be out and about that will have safe safe season. Also for teachers and uh, our school system that uh, have to, uh, I think, have to deal with those kids after they get all sugared up, I think, <laughs> the reason. Um, are there other prayer concerns that we need to mention uh, some of those, or there are others that we need to add to our list. Join me then as we uh, go to God in prayer, and then we'll conclude with the Lord's Prayer. In the name of Jehovah God, our, our Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Lord, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer petition for the needs of humanity. We ask an especial blessing during this season on our little ones. Some of those little ones who join us here today in our sanctuary, God, we ask a special blessing on them. You who made sure that they were not excluded, that they were brought to the center and, and made examples of what it really means to be part of your kingdom, that childlike enthusiasm and, and faith. So bless them, Lord, and bless all children as they go about the activities in the next few days. And those who lead them, parents, grandparents, teachers, others who have a role in their lives, may we be good conduits of your blessing. Lord, bless also our uh, nation as we go through a season of uh, political rancor and uh, upheaval. Uh, keep us as Christians anchored and of sound mind and to be a voice of uh, reason and solace in uh, a very tumultuous world and, and thereby uh, voice your concern for all people regardless of affiliations in any other place. And then bless, Lord, as we think about the places of our earth that are in the darkest of nights, war-torn, destruction, 
of life and property, victims of violence. It's everywhere. We confess that we don't understand the darkness of this world, but we do recognize it, and we know that apart from your light, it, it, there is no hope. So let us be ripples of hope as we pray um, your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. We will not um, take an offering physically in the sanctuary, but it is an attitude of offering that we invite you to have that um, God has been so good, so richly blessed us. And let us give back to God from the generosity that God has given to us, a small token of appreciation. Would you stand with me now as we sing the doxology, remain standing for our prayer meditation. Thank you.